Hi everybody, welcome to my channel, Life Law Bin. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm quite excited because I have a guest with me and the person I have with me is Dr. Ronnie Yearwood. Today we are going to speak about his journey into the legal profession and um, I know when we were speaking prior to, uh, to obviously recording this session you would have described yourself as an accidental lawyer. So I think this will be very interesting for us to listen to your journey into the legal profession, especially your educational journey. So I do know that you began um, in, with a history in political science, a background in political science. Do you care to share more about that with our, with our viewers? Okay, thank you, uh, Nia, for having me on your channel. I've been catching a few of the, uh, the shows. Really, really good, and it's a good idea for what you're doing for young lawyers and young professionals in terms of having folks on to describe their journey and, and share. And there's there's a lot more that that's needed. So thanks again for having me. Um, well, in ter terms of myself and my legal journey, uh, as I said, I, I I always phrase term myself an accidental lawyer. I started out in political science, sociology, at UE Cave Hill. Uh, then I went into work uh, in politics. So I used to work in the Prime Minister's office at that time. Um, started to work a lot on Caribbean single market and economy is issues. And then thought to myself, you know what, Ronnie, you need to understand more of the legal side. You've got the political side. So then I decided to uh, apply for some scholarships. Uh, at that time, I got the Chevening Scholarship. Literally, literally, um, threw a dart at a map, it hit Newcastle, and, <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's where I ended up. I ended up at Newcastle Law School to do my LLM in international trade law, one of the best uh, decisions I ever made, really, really enjoyable time at Newcastle, made uh, friends for life, uh, met my wife there. Um, you know, it, it, it was just a life, a life changing experience uh, in terms of uh, uh, Newcastle Law School. So I had done the masters, came back to Barbados, uh, was a little bit restless, wasn't sure what was the next step, if to continue with postgrad studies or to um, enter back into um, the world of uh, politics, so to speak, um, in terms of uh, working in the civil service uh, in the uh, Prime Minister's office. Um, again, just just by sheer, sheer um, accident, not even accident, just, just it just happened to work out that way that I also had a, another scholarship. Uh, so I had the National Development Scholarship and I decided, you know what, I'll start the PhD for a year. When I started my PhD, I didn't have a clue how I was going to finish in terms of funding because I just had some of the funding for a year. Um, and that was it. Uh, and, you know, I started and the rest is history. I finished in the three years, part-time jobs, internal scholarships. Uh, you know, you, you, do, you do what you have to do to get, to get through, keep your head down, um, finish in three years, pass the full corrections. And as I say, the rest is history. Ended up lecturing at Durham for about a year. Um, and during that time, I thought to myself, so you've got this PhD, you've got a master's in law. Hmm, you probably should practice law. <laughs> and that's when I applied for three firms. Uh, it was Asher's, um, Herbert Smith at that time. Uh, that probably ages me a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, and then um, Freshfields. Um, and um, I pretty much got, I got offers from all three of them. And I decided uh, to go with Asher's. And uh, the rest is history. So, you know, the, the getting a training contract funded my graduate diploma in law and my LPC. And then afterwards, uh, I was um, on to practicing law with Asher's. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was an enjoyable experience. It was one that I really shaped my professional views and and my um, and my approach to work in terms of um, the demands that can be put on you, the hours, the pace that you're meant to keep. So 
the, the, the quality of the output that you're meant to produce. And it's something that now I'm back in academia, that I've brought back into academia with me as well. What an incredible journey. Um, I'm sure that anyone listening would have noticed that you mentioned at least two scholarships, um, the Shevening Scholarship. I actually re released a video a couple of weeks ago on the mm -hmm. Shevening Scholarship. So, so we do know that that scholarship in and of itself is invaluable. And mm -hmm. you also benefited from another scholarship. So that's, that's always fantastic in terms of aiding in terms of aiding, you know, to facilitate your further yeah. education. So that's, that's, that's great. In terms of going back into academia, I know that we, we will um, finish the show on that, but do you think that you carried anything from practice um, to bear when you, when you went back into to academia? I think, I think the, the thing that I carried, um, and I think I mentioned it a little before just now, I think it's the, 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 the work ethic and the demands of um, practice. Practice tends to be very fast-paced. It tends to be sometimes short turnarounds. It requires um, long um, hours. It requires a production of uh, super high-quality work, and it requires... Um, a professional interaction with your clients at all times. Um, and not to say these things are not part of academia, because in terms of the, the new age of academia, these standards and this, 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 this are also required. But I think practice does something to you in terms of uh, ensuring that you can function in, uh, in, a, in a more nimble way. And, 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 it, and it's something that I think is important for lawyers. Um, and I think, I think all lawyers in some way, even academic lawyers, should have practiced at some point in their career because it informs your, your thinking in academia. And, and then when I say practice, I don't mean necessarily you should, you should have always been a lawyer, but you should have had some sort of uh, practical experience or professional experience outside of the law. I think, I think it really helps to shape you whether, or you should have been a lawyer because what, what I think it does, uh, it reminds us that our profession as lawyers is a practical one. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, if you reflect on Twining's great piece, Pericles and the Plumber, you know, lawyer as philosopher, lawyer as doer. At the end of the day, when you're a lawyer and your clients come to you, uh, you know, they don't want you to reflect on the history of whatever it is. They don't, they, don't, they don't care about the history of contract law or torts or how brilliant your exposition, your essays or your A's were in class. And they want to know, I've got a problem. I fell down at work. How, what compensation is available for me? What does the law allow me to do? Um, I've got a problem. I'm getting a divorce. Uh, I want to know if I can get a share in the house. I've got a problem, uh, you know, my rights have been violated by the government. How do I uh, seek redress? So, uh, I, and, I, and I, think, I think that is something you recognize in practice. Not that you divorce yourself from the academics and the theoretical thinking, but what you do, it informs your actions, but it's not necessary what the client will ever see. They don't, they don't see that part because that's not of interest to them. And nor should they necessarily see it because they don't have the time for it. So again, as I said, it comes back to that idea, that, that interesting concept, lawyer is thinker and lawyer as doer. So the lawyer is the, the high-minded philosophical uh, person, and then the lawyer as the plumber, the guy who just comes in, fixes the pipes. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you about practice in the UK, because um, I do know that you would have spent some time in the British Virgin Islands practicing what was that experience like for you? I think I think practice in the UK um, it was interesting. Um, it was tough um, because uh, if you're practicing, well, I practice in uh, London, um, so it's highly competitive. You have some of the best um, and smartest lawyers, not only from the UK, but you know, knowing London is a global city, you are competing not only with uh, local persons, but you're competing internationally. So to to get training contracts and pupillages, uh, many pupillages, whatever it is, you know, it's highly competitive, um, and and it's hard, and and that's that just goes without saying. Um, I found the experience to be rewarding because you're able to um, expand your network. 
you're able to work with some of the brightest minds. Uh, when you go in-house, in-house is always a very valuable experience for me. I was lucky and I had a chance to go in-house at Goldman Sachs, uh, which within itself was uh, an entire, a whole different experience of seeing how a global corporation operates um, in terms of the nuts and bolts and also being able to understand the place of an in-house lawyer within within a bank or, or just within within large corporations which may have their own in-house counsel. Now uh, after practicing in the UK and returning to the Caribbean I think BVI was my first stop uh, and it was my first stop naturally because as UK trained lawyers you can you can practice um, uh, directly. Um, uh, that experience was interesting because in some ways, uh, I, from my experience, it was a replication of the, the London law firm, but in the Caribbean. Um, and if that may, uh, makes me that a little bit, break that down, unpack that, in that you were dealing with many of the same clients that you would have dealt with in your London law firm. Now you were the BVI uh, offshore uh, component of whatever deal it was. So it, it was interesting that sometimes you would sit in London, when I worked in London, you would be emailing emailing folks uh, in the BVI um, saying, oh, we need to get this bit of, of the deal done. And then you became that guy, the, the, London, the London lawyers emailing you going, oh, you need to get this bit done. I need to get that uh, part of the company dealt with. Because, you know, there's some BVI company involved. Or, or whatever the whatever kind of deal you're trying to structure. Okay, and what? Because I know then that you would have moved from the British Virgin Islands and you returned to Barbados to practice as well, um, or to, to to eventually practice. That would have entailed you undertaking a conversion course in, mm -hmm. in Trinidad. What steps did you have to take in order to to get onto that conversion course? So the conversion course was uh, uh, interesting. The six-month conversion course uh, I did um, in Trinidad. Now, for me, uh, that entailed um, upgrading. So, so before, so just just a, a little note for persons who who studied in the UK, and if you've got your graduate diploma um, in law because you've converted um, uh, to to law having a previous degree. You, you should ensure that when you come away, you also come away with your GDL slash LLB. So to ensure that you have the LLB component and that could involve upgrading, which would involve maybe two or so additional courses, a research paper, a viva. It depends on what year you did your GDL, whatever the particular rules um, for, for ensuring your upgrade. Because uh, when you go to Hewitton, uh, what they would recognize, they only recognize the LLB. So it's, it's interesting that they don't see the GDL as a, as a complete uh, law degree, whereas in the UK, we know that you can have your GDL and just simply go on to become a barrister, solicitor, it does not matter, um, because really uh, there's a different approach to law. And, and hopefully in the Caribbean, we get there in that we allow people to have first degrees. We allow them... Uh, sorry, in the UK, you're allowed to have different experiences. You're allowed, I remember when I did my training contract, people had degrees in sciences, arts, music, so many, so history, so English lit, so many of us having different experiences and the GDL was a convergence. So what, you're, what you tend to create sometimes is a richer fabric and a tapestry of the legal profession. Whereas in the Caribbean, I don't think we're there yet because you, you almost have to make a decision, I want to be a lawyer at, you know, uh, 18, and that's what you have to stick with. And then if you, if you want to then later become a lawyer, you have to go and do another full law degree. Uh, whereas I think the UK recognizes, actually, you've got a degree. All we need to do is ensure that you now do the critical areas that make a lawyer. Uh, property, uh, torts, contracts, constitutional or admin or public law, uh, in the UK, it would have been EU law. For us, I guess it would be Caribbean, uh, Caribbean integration law, um, and and crime, criminal law. And you focus on those key aspects uh, because all the other things that you would recognize in a law degree are, are add-ons, are additionals. But really, really, when you come out of your law degree, there are about seven or eight things that you need to know, and included, for example, equity and trust. So I think some at some point we 
the Caribbean League of Professional Fraternity should consider that move um, to allow persons to have these graduate diplomas in law. That qualify them to, to, to practice. The closest we've come to it, I think, is having an accelerated LLB program. So you have a direct entry program that you can do at KFL in two years. Um, so I think that's as close as we've come to that flexible approach to legal training, which the UK um, has. And obviously it's taken time for them to get there, but that's something that they have. Definitely, because I, I even on, on my current course, the bar course, the mm -hmm. students come with various backgrounds. So obviously I have, a, I have an LLB, but mm -hmm. there are quite a few students that have joined the course. Some have degrees in banking and finance. Others, mm -hmm. as you say, stated, are, are in the arts. One of my friends has hers in genetic engin engineering. Yeah, and yeah. Because she has that um, degree, she decided, well, hang on a second. I actually don't want to, to specialize in this aspect of my training in genetic engineering. I actually want to take the legal route. So because yeah. she had that, that previous experience, the bachelor's in that area, she knew, okay, I just need to do the GDL and then go on to do uh, my legal training, get that mm -hmm. certificate in order to specialize in that particular area. So yeah. I definitely think that there is a place for there's a key place for those experiences yeah, yeah. um and and it also to me it also it also contributes to a, a, a well-rounded lawyer a yeah. lawyer that that shares and shares experiences in in other fields and you see those in applications as well for yeah. colleges or any other kind of legal work experience they love to know that you've been involved in some other kind of work experience outside of the law so yeah. I definitely think that that um, both in having that kind of experience experience outside of the legal profession is key and is vital also to help you um, understand sometimes clients' problems and 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 you know for you to to understand where they're coming from in order to to come up with the perfect solution for them. Yeah, but, because, yeah. Uh, no. No, and that's right, because the law, I think sometimes we forget that the law is uh, an instrument of regulation or an instrument of social change. And the people that the law is often affecting and regulating are people outside of the law. <laughs> and, and you need to understand what, what, how are they interacting with the law. I think sometimes lawyers forget that persons do not interact with the law the way that they interact with the law. Uh, we interact with the lawyer from our perspective in terms of theories, concepts, and when you get to practice and in terms of act, the details of it. Uh, but when people, that's not what people are seeing. They're either seeing the law as this blockage to whatever they're trying to do, or they're seeing the law as something that can facilitate it. Often, you know, the, the, the view is the law is in my way. And, and, you know, uh, so, so they don't necessarily see the law the way that we see it. And so I think having these experiences can add to, uh, to your professionalism and your approach to your clients to help them understand what you're trying to do for them as a lawyer um, in terms of facilitating whatever transaction or deal or, you know, like whatever life experiences that they want. Because sometimes we forget that law facilitates life experiences. Buying their first home, their marriage, you know, setting up a trust fund for their first child. All of these things, you know, the law is in, uh, but lawyers don't necessarily maybe see themselves as facilitating a life building experience. They're like, oh, I've just helped them buy their first home. But that's what you, you've done that, you know. It, yeah. So, yeah. so it helps so they to see the law from a different, from that angle. Um, yeah. So what was your experience like in Trinidad uh, pursuing that? Oh, yes. <laughs> the six-month program. Uh, I, you know what? To be honest, it was, it was an interesting experience. It was, it was tough for me because I, I still lived and, uh, well, mainly I was based in Barbados, so I was flying back and forth between, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Trinidad and Barbados for the oh. six months. Um, you know, I would wake up on Mondays around 4 a.m. Uh, to get to the airport around 5 a.m. or so, just before to get the 5.30 flight so I could get to class by 8 o'clock or so in the morning uh, in Trinidad. 
So, and I did that for six months continuously. It, it, was, it was a rough process for me um, because I couldn't necessarily uproot my, my life and my family and, and move to Trinidad. So that, that was the option I took, um, you know, uh, but you, you, other folks would have moved and lived in Trinidad for six months. But that just added to the additional um, toughness uh, from, from, from myself personally. Uh, in terms of the course, but the course is very practical. Um, and I think it's just to uh, introduce you to Caribbean concepts. So you have to do uh, Caribbean law and constitutional law. Uh, you have to do, um, um, what's it called? You have to do, I, I'm not gonna say, uh, you have to do ethics, you have to do advocacy. Um, you do, you do um, crim. So it's really to introduce you to the core components of, of, of what it is to practice law in the Caribbean, because the assumption is that you are a lawyer. So obviously you've, you've come in with all the other things, but really what they want to teach you is how does this work in the Caribbean? How do you deal with courts in the Caribbean? How, what's the process in terms of, so you do criminal law and then you do, obviously you do the civil side. What's the process for all these things? A bail application, what does that look like in this context? Uh, what is going before the court looks like in the Caribbean context? What are the ethics that lawyers uh, in the Caribbean follow? Uh, you also do uh, legal accounts, so you learn how to manage and, and keep your own books as lawyers, uh, which is something I remember doing when I did the uh, legal practice course, we had to do solicitor's accounts, um, mm -hmm. at which point in my head I thought I didn't sign up to do maths and <laughs> accounts <laughs> during this. But, you know. And I dodged it because I don't think we need to do it on the bar course. So I'm thinking I dodged it, but it seems as though when I come back for that conversion yes. course, the math will yes. be staring me my face. Yeah, you, you, will have to, you, will, you will have to do it. I, I was lucky because I'd already done it on the LPC, so I didn't have to repeat um, the process on the six month course. Oh. But it is the same, it's the same, from what I saw, it's the same kind, you know, you, know, you learn how to do ledgers and, and keep okay. your own books and things, because, um, because obviously lawyers are self-employed. So the yeah. idea is that you should, you should know how to manage your finances. But we know in practice, most lawyers will get an accountant. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you will get an accountant to do this kind of stuff. But, you know, it's important to learn things like, you know, you have personal accounts, you have your client accounts, the two shall never, ever mix. Um, and, and those kinds of things. So, so it, was, it was a good experience in terms of Caribbeanizing or, or adding the Caribbean components so that you can function effectively for your Caribbean clients. So you understand what the constitution of the Caribbean says. So you understand what the civil procedure rules of the Caribbean. What are the uh, procedure rules in terms of crime, bail applications, going, uh, evidence, all of these things, very, very important. So from that perspective, it's an important course. Um, and it's one that, 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 that you know, I think, I think any UK Caribbean lawyer should do. You know, maybe even if you don't want to practice here forever and ever, I think it's important to appreciate the context of, of Caribbean law. And I would encourage persons to do it. Um, I like the LPC and I think like the, uh, the bar vacation, of course, the BVC as well. There, there's a certain practicalness to it. You just have to, to, to shrug through. You just have to get through. Um, it's not like doing a, a LLB or a master's where, you know, you're uh, interacting with new fun ideas and, and things like that. Uh, it is a practical course. That's the nature of it. You learn practical things uh, and depending on what type of personality you are, some people love that stuff. If you have a slightly a little bit more academic leaning, you can find it. Uh, you can find it somewhat of a chore to do, but you know you do it and uh, you get you get through and you graduate and then you're allowed to to practice in the Caribbean, um, knowing that you've satisfied the requirements. Say, look, I get Caribbean law. I've been a lawyer in the UK. I've been a lawyer wherever in Canada, wherever I've been. Now get Caribbean law, I'm allowed to be called to the bar, Barbados, Trinidad, um, Jamaica, Guyana. Um, and, it's, and it's right that you should earn your stripes here. You know, six months, it's, it's over before you, before you know it. 
um, and and it, and it's a it's a fair thing, yeah. You know, if you so so, I would encourage folks to to do it at some point. You don't have to do it right away, but you know, it's something that you should consider consider doing. Yeah, definitely. You know, I'm gonna have to to find find my accounting books, my ledgers, because I did account <laughs> practice so I may have to take out those ledgers and have a quick look <laughs> before going yeah. in. Yeah. Um, we do know, though, that you currently lecture at uh, the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill. Mm-hmm. And I think this, this would be a great opportunity for students to get a flavor of what is expected from, from them, um, from, from an educator mm-hmm. such as yourself. To, to achieve the, the best marks that they possibly can. So do you have any advice for law students um, at the LLB level as it pertains to critically analyzing and um, exercising those skills effectively in essays? I think, I think the, the key um, to doing well in a law degree, um, as in any degree, um, I often tell my students, I am teaching you law, but I could be teaching you maths, I could be teaching you music, I could be teaching you art, literature, dance, medicine, dentistry, carpentry, building, because any subject area, all we're teaching you to do is to understand the world around you. I happen to teach you law, you happen to be a lawyer, so the way you understand the world is in legal constructs. If I was teaching you literature, you will understand the world through literature. If I teach you math, through math, science. So really, all, I, all I'm doing is giving you critical thinking skills. You just happen to be doing it in contracts, or IP, or land law, or property, or constitutional. So the idea of critical thinking does not go away or does not necessarily change at its core because the subject matter changes. I think some of my students come in thinking that there's some special alchemy or art or magic. But really, it's just about reading, understanding, and then being able to unpack ideas when you see them and reconstruct them and make arguments your own, being able to put forward your ideas clearly. And you know, I always tell students, you know, at its most basic, a good essay does three things, introduction, body, three or four points, and a conclusion. That formula, that concept does not change at university, it's the same at high school, it's the same at primary school. The, 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 the fundamentals of good argument are the same at every level. Obviously, at university, we expect you to up the game. So, so now you need more evidence. You know, maybe at secondary level, you could have gotten away with one citation or one main book, the textbook, it was fine to quote everything from there. When you move to university level, we expect the textbook becomes background reading. And if you're going to cite, you need to cite from papers and cases. So you have to you're still making critical arguments. Now those arguments have to be backed up with more evidence and the level of the evidence that you're presenting goes up and the quality goes up. So if if persons, if students, I think, see it as an exercise like that, they wouldn't feel overwhelmed because I think that's sometimes the problem. They come in and they're like, oh, there's so much to do. What do I, what do I quote? Oh my God, I've got two books to read. I've got three articles to read. I think if, if, if there's a, a, a sense where students step back uh, almost take a breath and realize, actually, you know, this is pretty doable. I know, I, I understand the arguments here. I just need to be able to construct them in a clear, logical way um, that, that, that questions and interrogates the information before me um, and, and present the evidence, whether that's in the form of cases or from scholarly works and articles and, and things, to make these arguments. And I think, I think students would do fine and they would get the grades that they want. And I think the last bit of advice, I would say, don't necessarily go in aiming for grades. If you aim to make good arguments, you will get the grades. If you, if, if you, if you aim just to make the arguments, do the reading, do the background stuff, the grades will come. Uh, and, I, and I think that's the best way to approach it because I think sometimes when you, when you end up grade chasing, you miss the point and, and you miss a lot of the, the learning and the, and the really exciting um, knowledge exchange that should be taking place. But if you kind of just 
almost not forget about the grades, but just focus on the aspects of presenting good arguments and good work, the grades will the grades will come. And you you will do you will do well. Um, and a lot of it is about taking an ownership of your work as well. That's the other key advice. It's not it's not the lecturer's work, it's not the uni's work, it's not Mrs. So and so's course or Dr. This's course. It is your course. It is your course because if you realize at the end of the day, when you become a lawyer and someone rocks up to you for a contract, uh, they want a mortgage, uh, they want you to look at their mortgage, they want you to uh, help set up a trust fund, they, I don't know, they're, they're at the police station, it's midnight. Um, at that particular point, it's definitely not Mrs. or Dr. Something's course. You need to somehow remember, you know, what goes in the contract. Okay, I need these three elements. Okay, I need to figure out um, was there oral contract? Was there written contract? I need to talk to my client about these things. Okay, it's twelve o'clock. My client's at uh, at the police station. How long has he been there? Has, you know, have they held him over his time? Have they told him what yeah, what he's been charged? All of these things. And at that point, that is you. That's all at you. You need to own that process and that information. And I think that needs to start from at university, that ownership of the course, that ownership of the information and the knowledge, because that's the stuff that you're going to be required to uh, display and practice when you become a lawyer. And even if you don't become uh, a lawyer in terms of the day-to-day -day going to court or a lawyer in a law firm, you know, if you go in-house, it's still the same. Or you might even switch fields. You could get into management or human resources. You know, lawyers tend to be very flexible in where they end up working. You're still going to be called upon to, 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 to utilize this, these skills and these knowledge, uh, this, this, this knowledge, sorry, that you, that you will have. Finally, um, I think that's, that's brilliant advice. But finally, I, I, I did want to ask you a question about critical analysis. Mm -hmm. Some students tend to only figure out um, how to critically analyze uh, at the end of the degree program. Mm -hmm. Sometimes many of us seem to think that all you need to do is look at the facts and maybe regurgitate a couple things without analyzing or as you quite uh, earlier referred to it, unpacking key concepts. What, you know, what advice would you give students to help them build that uh, critical analysis toolkit, for lack of better terms? Um, I, think, I think a lot, a big part of it, from my experience, has almost been fair. I think um, students tend to sometimes are afraid that if they say something, it doesn't necessarily have the value. Or it, how dare they question, you know, professor or doctor who's written this paper, um, this is supposed to be an expert in the field. I, you know, I'm not, I've read that. I don't think he got it right, but you know what? I'm not going to say anything because, um, but that's the critical analysis. If you read a paper and you think, actually, that logic does not add up. A plus B can't be E. It's supposed to be C, but he's, he's made an argument there and actually he's covered, the argument's incorrect or he's covering something because he's trying to put to conflict two arguments I see, and if you see, that's where the critical analysis thing comes. I think sometimes students are maybe slightly afraid or overwhelmed that they don't have the power to interrogate that, the work in that way um, because that's an academic, that's doctor, and that's professor, that's my lecturer. Um, but that's what we want you to do. We want you to interrogate the work in that intelligent way. When you see, um, when you see arguments that, are not necessarily fitting together, or you think actually A plus B equals to C, but you're saying equals to D, and I do not understand how you've gotten there because you've missed up something. You, you've missed an element, or this theory can't cover everything that you're talking about. You've identified a theory that says there are, I don't know, let's, let's start, seven elements of happiness, but that's not right because we know that there might be eight, and there's eight because of these reasons, and you say that, or you've identified a particular theory that tells me that the law 
has to be uh, what judges say, but that's not correct all the time because we know sometimes the law is actually what's written as the law. Um, do judges make law? Do they interpret law? You know, and you and you need to just struggle with the ideas. And I think that's the other thing. Students feel that if they're struggling with the information, that they're not getting it, or that they're that somehow something's wrong. Sir, I've I've read the article once and I don't understand it. Well, you know what? That's fine because even as academics, professors, uh, lecturers, we read articles and we need to read them two or three times. We read the case and we will read it two, three, four times as well before we get the points. So don't think that you read it once and you don't get it and you just throw your hands up in frustration because somehow in your head, everyone out there is magically reading this thing once and everything comes. No, there's nothing wrong with struggle. The struggle is actually important because then your brain is kicked into a gear of trying to figure out what is this case about? What, what was the judge really trying to say here? Because he made an argument in paragraph 10, but I see he's done something in paragraph 20, and it's the exact opposite was what he was trying to do in paragraph 10. Something is, is not right here. And if he's done that, what is he trying to do? Is he just trying to get an equitable outcome irrespective of the law? Because look, this, this particular family or this, um, this woman with the kids, she's going to be kicked out of the house. So he needs to find some way to get to the argument because equity needs to prevail at that point, irrespective of what the actual common law may be doing. So you, so you, so you need to get comfortable with not understanding or you need to get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable when you're reading things because... I don't get this at the first time. I'll tell you, that's okay. None of us get it at the first time. Sometimes we have to read things two, three times, and and that's fine. And that, so 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 so, having that discomfort and that struggle is part of the process. Um, and I think students sometimes find that off-putting because perhaps maybe you're so used to, at the secondary level, things feeling a little bit more natural and like oh, I've read it, I've got that. Oh here's an essay, A, and then all of a sudden, you're in an environment where you're like, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. This doesn't make sense. But, you know, everyone is in the same way. And, 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 and even, and anyone pretending they're not, I don't think that's the truth. I think everyone feels discomfort. And not, because we're all struggling to understand things, and that's okay. Doesn't, and, the, and the older and the, the more you get in the profession, don't think that this stops. I see, I've seen partners trying to read law and, and think, and they've been partners for years. I mean, 20, 30, and they're like, what the hell, what's going on with this case? What did the judge do? I don't get, I'm trying to still make connections because that's what we do every day, all day. That is what the profession is about. Well, I don't think that, you know, could have been articulated any better. And uh, thank you very much for coming on the channel today. I, I learned a lot definitely. So I know that our viewers would have enjoyed this session today. So that's a wrap folks. Uh, thank you again Dr. Thank you for, for coming on the, on the channel and we'll see you on the next video. See you later guys. Bye.